All right, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, thank you for this wonderful day you've given us. Thank you for strengthening us to get us through this life, Lord, with joy and peace and patience. And I pray that the word that goes forth out of my mouth, Lord, direct it, let it be your words, and let it find root in people's hearts, Lord, to bear much fruit. Help us to draw closer to you and to shake off the weights and sins which so easily beset us. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, we're going to talk about abiding in Christ and what that means. It is so very important to Jesus that we abide in him. In fact, he says in John 15, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my word abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples." We as Christians are supposed to abide in Christ, but we live in a day and age where it seems like we're trying to abide in everything but Jesus, where we're trying to find our sustenance and our, our life and our satisfaction in the things of the world. And then when our lives lack the fruit of the Spirit, when it lacks what it says in Galatians 5, 22 to 23, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Well, we get confused. Why don't we have hope, peace, joy? And Ephesians 5, 9 says, for the fruit of the Spirit that we only produce by abiding in Jesus is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And it says in Romans 14, verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And so God wants us to have righteousness, peace, joy, and all these fruits of the Spirit. And yet the only way to get them is not by meat and drink, like Romans just told us, and it's not by our accomplishments, and it's not by getting particular things done, it's by abiding in Jesus Christ. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. But what does it really mean to abide in Jesus Christ? Well, abide can mean to live and dwell in, to accept or act in accordance with. So we would live in Jesus Christ. We would accept the way that he does things and we would act and live in accordance with how he would tell us to act and live in his word. The Greek word for abide is meno or meno, which is the one used the most. And that word can mean to take up permanent residence or to make yourself at home. So think about how God compares us to being a branch and he is the main vine. If that branch does not make its permanent abode, its permanent home attached to that vine, it will shrivel up, it will die. It can't make it on its own. The vine won't die if it loses the branch, but the branch will die if it gets detached from the main vine. And that branch, it constantly needs that main vine. There is not a time in its life where it can be separated and be fine. It is thirsty, it is hungry. It gets all of its nutrition, all of its water, all of its 
substance and sustenance from that main vine. And our lives are supposed to be the same, where we are constantly abiding in Christ, abiding in His Word, acting in accordance with what He tells us to do, living, meditating, and speaking, and singing His Word, and eating His flesh, and drinking His blood. And we need to live in and dwell in accordance with our Savior. We can look at famous people like Whitney Houston and Elvis Presley and so many others. Even at eight years old, you know, God gave me that supernatural download to understand that if they could not find satisfaction with fame, worldwide fame, and having money and mansions and accomplishment and platinum selling albums and so on and so forth, and they died of drug overdoses because they felt empty. They couldn't be satisfied with those things. And even at a, as a young girl, God gave me that divine revelation that if they could not find satisfaction through those things, neither could I. And we all need this divine revelation. We all need to stop trying to search elsewhere than Jesus Christ. And sadly, I see this among so many Christian brothers and sisters who are trying to find that fulfillment in jobs, hobbies, retirement funds, fantasies, fables, getting pay raises, material things, buying this, buying that, pursuing this, pursuing that, and they're shriveling up inside. They're not full of joy. They're not full of peace. They're not full of long suffering and faith and kindness. Instead, they're tortured and they just think that if they can get more of these things, that they'll finally be satisfied. And the Bible says in Jeremiah 2 verse 13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In Isaiah 55, 1 to 3 says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me, and hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Let's read that one verse again. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? We are a nation that spends millions and millions of dollars on not food and not things that satisfy. We spend it on material possessions, on cars, name brand items and purses and, and shoes and makeup and houses and cars and jewelry. And we go into dollar stores and we go into Target and we go into Bon Ton and we go and we just keep on consuming and consuming and consuming. And yet, according to a CNN article from 2016, one in six Americans are on some kind of psychiatric drug mostly antidepressants. So clearly, these things don't work. They don't fill us. They're broken cisterns. We're wasting our labor for that which does not satisfy. And yet, so many times, including myself, we find ourselves thinking, if I can just buy this, if I can just get that, and we set our affections on those things, and we buy the item, we get a momentary spike in joy, and then we lose it. And so we're off to get the next dress. We're off to get the next tool for our shed. We're off to go to another thrift store to find more cool items to fill our house with. And yet those things will never, ever satisfy. Instead of pursuing those things that are broken, that are empty, we should live in and abide in Jesus Christ. Find our satisfaction in Him. Because if we don't do that, then we are chasing after the wind. Toiling wheel, slaving to make it from day to day.
trying to gain something to hold, hoping to fulfill the expectations of those around you, but they will and you will never be satisfied, don't you Something invisible Why do you chase after the wind? Let me help you, my dear Show you why you live and are here It's not for momentary it's not to achieve the standards of the world around you. Jesus alone knows the reason you live is why you're here. All else will disappear. You chase after the wind. Why do you chase after? So meaningless and cold You chase after the wind Why do you chase after the wind? Trying to grasp something invisible Why do you chase after the wind? Don't sell your song for months Everything's for pleasures that won't bring eternal life. Don't chase after the wind. Why do you chase after the wind? So meaningless and cold. You're instead repent and give your heart, your life to Him. And you If we don't pursue and abide in Jesus and live our lives for Him, then we're just chasing after the wind. And it's meaningless and it's cold and it will never bring you comfort and it will never satisfy. And at some point when we're doing this and we get distracted chasing after these things, we shouldn't be surprised when our, our love, our hope, our peace, and all of those fruits of the Spirit, they just start shriveling up and and disappearing from our hearts. For example, we have a peach tree in our yard and right now it's full of little peaches and they're still growing and they're still ripening and they're not, they're not tasty yet, you can't eat them. What if I were to break off one of those branches full of peaches? Well, yes, it's full of fruit, but if one day it ceases to abide in that main vine, that main trunk, and I separate it from it, Will it continue to grow? Will it continue to thrive? Will those fruit keep on ripening, those little peaches? No, it'll shrivel up, those peaches will fall off. And that's the same with us. It doesn't matter if you've been walking and loving and serving God for 10, 20 years, and you're on fire for Him, and you're attached to Him, and you have the fruits of the Spirit in your life, and they're constantly growing in you, and then all of a sudden, you get broken off, because all of a sudden the things of the world become more important to you and you grow cold and you stop eating your word and you stop praying and spending time with Jesus, bit by bit, all of those fruits will start shriveling up in your life.
Bit by bit, you will start dying inside unless you reattach yourself to Jesus and start eating from him and drinking his blood. You will shrivel up and you'll die away. And the Bible says that in that case, if you die, if he says, They'll gather them into the fire, and they're good for nothing but to be burned. We don't want to be like that. And how do we know that we are still attached to Jesus, that we are living and abiding in him? The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Hereby we know that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him, he that says he abides in Jesus, it ought also himself to walk even as he walked. Which means that if we are abiding in Jesus, we'll keep his commandments and we will walk as Jesus walked. And Jesus was full of love and kindness and he was holy. You didn't see him out there lying and stealing and committing fornication and adultery and, and getting drunk and doing things of the world. You didn't see him being ugly and nasty. And so if we, he was full of love. And how are we supposed to know if we abide in him? If we are walking and acting like Jesus did, if we are keeping his commandments. And so if we are claiming that we know Jesus, that we are firmly attached to that main vine and we are abiding in him, and we're not actually keeping his commandments and we're being nasty and we're pursuing things of the world instead of Jesus and we don't walk and talk the way Jesus did or strive to do so, then we are a liar and the truth is not in us. And we need to be told this message today because many Christians who are not actually Christians, who are doing what their flesh dictates instead of what Jesus tells them to do, they're being lied to and said, you're good to go but you're not good to go. You're not abiding in Jesus if you are not doing what the Bible says, but what, to keep God's commandment. But what exactly is this commandment? John goes on to say in verse seven, brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. So this new and old commandment goes back to what Jesus himself said in Mark 12, verses 29 to 31. And Jesus answered him and said, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. So to abide in Christ is to keep his commandments. And to keep his commandments means to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so automatically we know that if we're bitter, if we hate, if we, if we have unforgiveness towards our brother, which is our neighbor, which people in our lives, that we're not abiding in God. And that's extremely dangerous because Jesus, who said in Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. 
Jesus said this. This is part of the new covenant. He said you must forgive in order to be forgiven of your father. And we cannot lie to ourselves. Please don't lie to yourself and say that, oh, I can be bitter and I can hate them and I can be angry. God will understand. No, God can't break his word. He's not a man that he should lie. And so we need to ask God to help us forgive and repent for chasing after things that don't matter, for being bitter and angry and easily offended. Remember, love suffereth long and is kind. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. And this is the kind of love that God wants us to have for our neighbor. This is the kind of love that he wants us to bear as fruit on our branches, in our lives as we abide in him. So we can choose to repent and say, Lord, please forgive me. I do forgive this person by faith. It doesn't matter if the emotions linger for a while. I choose to forgive. And Lord, please forgive me for constantly getting distracted and chasing after entertainment and things that won't fulfill me. Because those things, they're an empty trail that will lead off a cliff and they'll leave you broken and, and and dead at the bottom of a pile of sharp stones. We don't want to pursue those things. First John says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Then we jump down to verse 28, and now little children abide in him, that when he, when Jesus shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him. We live in a day and age of so many false teachings where they're saying once saved, always saved, where they say you can live in flagrant sin like adultery and, and immoral lifestyles and gender on gender and that you'll still go to heaven. And that's not true. The Bible says it's not true. And yet many of us don't even know what the scripture says. And another thing the Bible says that God is not okay with covetousness, that he's not okay with a life of greed. And yet we're taught that we can just use God to get more and more stuff for our life. But if we would just read the Bible, we would discover that's not the case. And so what I need, what we all need to do is just open the word of God to eat it, to drink it, to consume it. You need to know what's in the word of God so Satan cannot lead you astray. Right here it says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And this is New Testament after Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. This is not the old covenant. And ye know that he, Jesus Christ, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him, whoever abides in Jesus Christ, sinneth not. Whoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. 
For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And wherefore did he slew, wherefore did he kill him? Because his own works were evil and his brothers righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive that we love, that we have the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because... We keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. So this is how we know that Jesus abides in us. We're not walking in blatant sin. We are walking in righteousness. We're walking in love. This is so very important that we can tell by people's fruits if they are in fact abiding in Christ. And so let's not deceive ourselves and tell ourselves, I can do this and God will be okay with it. Because He's not okay with flagrant sin. Galatians 5, 19 to 23 says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And I know I hit this week after week after week because not enough people are preaching it. And when I go online, I see one or two who stand up and say, you can't commit adultery and not repent and go to heaven. And people in the comments say, well, that's condemnation. That's old covenant. No, right here in the New Testament. Do not deceive yourselves. The devil is trying to steal you your soul. You will never, ever, 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 ever get out of hell if you die committing fornication and you have not repented, or if you are hating your brother, or if you are living for yourself and you're not loving God and trying to please him. Yes, we stumble. Yes, we make mistakes. But that's why we repent and we call out to him and say, Lord, I want to bear much fruit. The Bible doesn't say you have to have a gazillion fruit on your branch. He says you need to bear fruit. So he wants to see that love developing in your heart, that joy, that peace, that righteousness to abide in the truth. And many people today say that it is a hate language when we tell them that they can't live in moral sins and make it to heaven. But no, that is not hate. It is love. It is love to tell them, you can't do these things and inherit eternal life. If I love you, which I do because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, then I will tell you the truth in meekness and in fear, knowing that you have to wake up. You cannot let the devil steal your salvation to steal your soul from you. And the Bible says that 
to abide in God is to have his love and his life flowing out of us like a river and out of us toward people. We have an active relationship with Jesus Christ that transforms and changes us. People can see that transformation and change in us. John 7, 38 to 39 says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And John 13, verse 35 says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. So without loving one another, we're just deceiving ourselves and telling ourselves that we're Christians. I want us to be honest with ourselves. Are we being ugly, nasty, selfish, self-centered? Are we self-pleasing, doing things that don't please God? Are we really abiding in Jesus the way that we need to? Maybe we're just hanging on by a thread and we're just getting just a little bit of life in us and a little bit of sustenance. And so we're withering a little bit slower than those who are totally broken off. But we need to be fully attached to Jesus. So we have rivers of water flowing out of us. And so are we walking the way that we need to walk in Jesus Christ? I want to ask you, what does it mean when we call ourselves a Christian. What does it mean to be a Christian? Have you ever asked yourself this question? What does it mean to be a Christian? Is it a title or a meaningless suggestion? What does it mean for each day? Does it change the way I act, think, behave, or do I always stay the same? Only claim to believe in his name. What does it mean? What does it mean? It means a life of sacrifice to dedicate my life to Christ, to walk in love and do what's right in spite. Christian, what do you say when they ask you, or do they even ask you this question? Why do you live so different? Why do you act and talk so divergent? Why do you walk and talk and love, even when everyone treats you wrong? What does it mean? What does it mean? It means I There is a woman in the New Testament 
who knew what it was to truly love the Lord with all of her heart. And we've talked about her love and her sacrifice for the past 2,000 years, just like Jesus proclaimed it would be. And that woman is Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. In Luke 10, we read in 38 to 42, Now it came to pass as they went, that he, Jesus, entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore, that she come and help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken from her. I think many of us can relate to Martha here. I certainly can. We get so wrapped up in our daily to-do list and our accomplishments and things we need to get done. And our time with Jesus Christ, it gets pushed to the back burner. It's like we're a sink and we get clogged up with all the food scraps and all the extras. And maybe initially some of that water gets through the drain, but eventually, eventually things start to really clog up. The food and everything else starts to stink and rotten if it doesn't get cleaned out. And eventually that water just overflows the sink and goes out into the cupboards and it makes an absolute mess. And that's us like that sink where we get clogged up with the cares of the world and we get clogged up with being busy and we start stinking and our attitudes start stinking and we start complaining and we start getting snappy and nasty and impatient and stressed out and then the way we treat people degrades and our fear and anxiety it, it grows like the mold in that sink and meanwhile we just pile more and more into that sink thinking if I could just get this done, if I could just earn more money, if I could just accomplish this, then my life would suddenly stop sinking, stinking and these pipes wouldn't be clogged anymore. But it's the opposite. The more we shove in that sink, the worse our problem is going to be. I have been so guilty about this to where someone said to me, probably prophetically, he said, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. So we need to stop rushing and running about and stressing and instead be like Mary. She put Jesus Christ first. She sat at his feet. She took the time out of her day to listen to his word. And Jesus said she has chosen that which is needful. It is absolutely needful that we do that. And yes, it made other people upset that she put Jesus Christ first, that she took time out of her day to sit there and read and listen to him. But we need to not care what the world thinks and to do what Mary did when she sat at the bottom of his feet instead of running around like a chicken with our head cut off. And we need to choose the good part and ask God, what have I allowed to clog up my life, to take the place of you, to cause me to become a mess and to mold and, and to start falling apart? And what hobbies, worries, distractions, anxieties, etc., etc., have I allowed to pile up and distract me from you, Jesus? Because we all need to ask God to help us put him first. And we could do this one day, and then the next day, he gets pushed to the back burner all of a sudden again. And we need to constantly be sitting at his feet, constantly putting him first. It's not that we don't work, it's just that we first, we put Jesus first and we take time to eat his word and drink his blood like he told us to. Because he says in Matthew 4 verse 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And moreover, Jesus says in John 6, verses 53 to 56, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. And John 1 verse 14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glorious of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
We live in a day and age where a lot of us have replaced the Word of God with other things. And yet the Bible says, unless ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye shall have no life in you. And we know what that flesh is. It says, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And so what we're supposed to be constantly meditating on, singing, consuming, is the Word of God. And the Bible says in John 15, 6 to 8, which we read, if ye abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. So if we want life, if we truly want to live, if we want to hear God's voice clearer and louder and have him instructing us, then we need to eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink His blood. We need to read the Word of God, sing it, meditate on it, live by it. And if all the world says, no, that can't be true, we say, Lord, Your Word is my foundation. Your Word is my solid rock on which I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And that way, when the storms of life come, because they will come, we will keep on standing. And the Bible says in Ephesians 5, verses 18 to 20, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's another clue of how we can abide in Christ. Throughout the day we can say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, I'm alive. Thank you that you will turn the situation around. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. And then we can start singing and say, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Or the Bible says in James 1, verses 21 to 26, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness. We have to admit that we're wrong a lot of the times because our pride will say, no, no, I don't care what the Word of God says, but the Bible says meekness. We have to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and He shall lift us up and receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save your souls but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if a man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he does behold himself, and he goeth his way, and straightway he forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And so what we see in the Bible is that how God wants us to walk, how he wants us to talk, and how he wants us to be full of love and compassion and to stand up for righteousness and against the standard of Jesus Christ, we can see how far we fall short. And if we walk away from comparing ourselves to Jesus Christ, all of a sudden we start thinking, oh, I'm pretty good. My righteousness is not that bad. But the Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so we need to look into the perfect law of liberty. We need to look into God's mirror and see what he shows us of ourselves and let him constantly change us and constantly say, hey, I wasn't pleased with the way that you just talked to your, your brother, your sister. And let him in meekness change us through his word. So we need to do the word and not just hear the word. But how can we be doers of the word if we don't know what's in it? For example, there's a major message of covetousness out there, of one of constantly acquiring more and more money and things and spending all of our time in relationship with Jesus, asking and seeking those things. But again, we read the word and he says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And 
the world passeth away and the lust thereof. And it says in 1 Timothy 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. And it says in Luke 12, he talks about this young man who said, Master, he said this to Jesus, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus said, Back to him, man who made a judge, me a judge or a divider over you, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he goes on to tell the story of the rich man who his barns were full. And he said to himself, soul, you have many goods. Sit back and take your ease. And I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger ones so I can store even more stuff in them. Instead of giving to the poor, instead of being a, a, a showing love to his neighbors. And Jesus said, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. And he said, then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So this message of not chasing after possessions and constantly trying to get more, it goes back to abiding in Jesus and realizing that those things can never ever satisfy us. So many of us, we're trying to abide and live in and off what we can buy and what we can accomplish and what we can do instead of giving our everything to Jesus Christ. Mary took that pound of ointment of spikenard, something which was extremely valuable, and that she could have used to make her life more comfortable, and she used it on Jesus. It says, Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. And Jesus said, let her alone, because they were angry with her. They said, we could have sold this and given it to the poor. But she didn't give it to the poor. She first and foremost gave it to Jesus. And Jesus said, let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. And Mark 14, she hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Sure enough, we're still talking about Mary anointed Jesus' feet, how she loved him so much that she sat at his feet and listened to his word, how she gave that expensive ointment that she could have used to make her own life more comfortable, and yet she gave it to Christ. And as Christians, we need to emulate her example. We need to make time for Jesus, to abide in him, to read his word. We need to give him our hearts, our loves, our, our everything, our devotion, our valuable possessions. We need to abide in him and give him our everything. Hi, my name is Stephanie Egger, and this is a song I wrote called I will give everything. How much will you give? I hear the people ask. How much will you sacrifice of your one and only life? How much will you let slip away? Time is flying fast. Is this really all okay? Don't you want to keep a little bit for yourself? Don't you want to live a little bit for yourself? So how much, how much will you give? I will give everything. I will give everything. I will, I will give everything. A whole nothing back. I promise you that I will give everything. How much will you give? 
I hear my Jesus ask, how much will you sacrifice? Will you give me of your life? All else will fade and slip away. Only what you do for me will remain. On that day we meet at the end face to face, standing at heaven's gate, what will you hear me say? So how much, how much will you give? I will give everything. I will give everything. I will, I will give everything. I hold nothing back. I promise you that. That I will give everything. I'll give my emotions, I'll give my pride, all my worthy possessions. There's nothing I will hide. I will, I will give everything. I will, I will give everything. I will, I will give everything. Just to hear you say this was me. On that day you're meeting destiny. Well done, well done, my child. You gave me everything. Well done. Thanks for listening. Above all, on that day that we see Jesus' face, I want to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. <laughs> Welcome into the joy of the Lord. Come on in. That's what I want to hear God say. And it doesn't matter if the world disagrees with us. Our whole goal is to love Jesus Christ, to abide in him, for his word to abide in us, to give everything we have to him, to truly be an example of what it means to be a Christian, to love, to sacrifice, to give, to walk in holiness and truth. And it is a hard path. It's a narrow path. And the Bible says that it's a narrow path. But through his grace and strength, we keep on calling unto our Father. And he says, I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. And so let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, I thank you for this word which has gone forth, and I pray that you help us, reveal to us in our lives, Lord, where we have not fully abided in you, where we've let things clog up our lives and clog up our emotions, and where we have grown cold towards you, Lord, and that we not be lukewarm, but instead we be bold for you, that we love you, that we obey obey you, that we read your word, that we eat your flesh and drink your blood because there's no other way to have life in us. And I thank you, Lord, for helping us and equipping us and strengthening us to walk on this narrow road until the day we finally meet face to face. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.